Okay, hi, uh, hi everybody. So I'm uh, very happy to have uh, Arno with uh, with us today. Uh, probably most of you uh, have already met him when he visited us in in the past. I think that uh, that occurred uh, a couple of times. But for those who don't know him, he's an assistant professor in, in machine learning. He's done a lot, a lot of work on Gaussian process model and their link with uh, state-based models. And uh, Arno is going to talk about something a bit different today because he's talking about uh, uh, stationary activations for uncertainty calibration in deep learning. So thank you very much, Arno, for uh, agreeing to do this seminar with us today. And uh, the floor is all yours. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I'm very happy to join you, uh, even though uh, it would have been nicer to actually be at your office. Uh, but what can we do? Um, it looks like I'm talking about something different, but once we, we progress with the, with the slides, you will actually notice that uh, all the usual signal processing stuff that I, I often, often present uh, about is, is actually there all, also this time. So um, the, the talk title is Station Activations for Uncertain Calibration in Deep Learning. Um, this work was recently accepted to, to NeurIPS this year and uh, will be later, well, it's early December when it's presented at the conference, which will also be online, of course, this year. Um, this is joint work with two of my students, um, basically Lasse Meronen, who recently started his PhD, and Christabel Edvanto, who uh, did, his, uh, did her master thesis uh, here at Alt University with me. And actually, Christabella is currently in Cambridge uh, working for Microsoft Research. So um, you might stumble upon her uh, when, when doing your grocery shopping or, or so. But great. Um, the outline of the talk, uh, which will last, I don't know, 30 to 45 minutes maybe, uh, if there aren't too many questions. But I, of course, hope that there are many questions uh, and I have reserved plenty of time for, for staying around for for discussions. Uh, I guess you can just interrupt me, uh, just shout out if you have anything to ask. Um, it will get somewhat technical at some point, so then uh, we can slow down and go through it all the details uh, that are unclear. So if something feels strange or unclear, then just interrupt me and we, we will go through the details. Okay, so I'll start with, with kind of a motivating example. Uh, at least it was most motivating for me uh, and one of the things that sort of triggered this project uh, last spring, just before the, the uh, New York's deadline. Um, then there's an actual sort of introduction uh, to, to the, 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 the paper uh, and to the topics that are covered. Um, then I'm covering some, some old, old background stuff uh, from, from like uh, links between GPs and neural networks. Um, after which uh, there is kind of a package of signal processing uh, notation and theory that is required for sort of then taking the big leap in actually sort of deriving uh, some modern activation functions. We'll get back to this, what that actually means. Uh, and then I have a range of experiments which uh, show that how great and awesome uh, this all, all, all is. And then I, I conclude talk with a short recap. Um, so the motivation for this, um, this actually goes back quite a bit. So uh, before last he started his, um, his PhD with me, uh, he, he did his master thesis uh, in my group and he was actually looking into like uh, uncertainty quantification in deep learning. Um, and the first project that he, he then worked on uh, last spring um, after starting his PhD was actually like combining some like learning based things with uh, some uh, sense of fusion applications. So basically trying to, to improve uh, visual inertial uh, tracking and navigation uh, by uh, using deep learning for estimating optical flow. So basically you have, have inertial sensors which tell about the, the movement of, for example, a, a, a mobile phone, um, but then Similar movement information is also present in the in the uh, camera data because sort of also how what the camera sees, what how that changes, 
also tell about the movement of the, of the device. So then typically uh, the camera data is, is treated by some like very classical uh, computer vision uh, methods where you track some like feature point, points, so on. But then if you apply uh, like contemporary uh, deep learning methods for estimating like the uh, optical flow field of, of how like the, the uh, video frames uh, change uh, between sort of uh, when different frames come in, then you can actually sort of get quite good knowledge of, of what the camera actually sort of sees uh, in like movement wise. And deep learning is of course like uh, the way you do computer vision these days is, is that you have uh, these huge neural networks that you train you know, like basically overfit to some, some uh, training data and then you use that. And that was what we also did here. Um, we, we estimated the, the, um, the optical flow, uh, which can then in this learning based methods leverage sort of like, uh, like visual cues in the data and not just like sparse feature points. And then because we were actually interested in downstream tasks, we want to actually like combine this sort of uh, computer vision pipeline with uh, like a visual inertial uh, motion estimation technique, which basically boils down to doing Kalman filtering. Um, it was kind of important to also be able to quantify the uncertainty of the outputs of the deep learning model. And uh, here, like uh, on the right side of the slides, you can actually see some of the, like, the optical flow, flow, uh, flow um, which has been estimated from, from these two frames on, on, the, on the left side, and then uh, some uncertainty estimates of what the, the optical flow, flow gets out. And the uncertainty estimates were kind of telling something sensible, but not that sensible stuff. And then uh, after discussing with Lassie about this and then looking into the, the problem, uh, it actually came, became quite clear that the problem was not uh, kind of the, the, the inference part, but more in the, the modeling, how the model was set up. And that kind of then led to uh, like asking questions of like, are the deep learning models actually the kind of models that we want to use in, in these, these sort of uh, applications. So uh, this sort of then uh, links to like deep learning with probabilistic principles or, or like Bayesian deep learning, where you actually try to quantify not only like point estimates, but then capture some of the the uncertainty that is that is uh, also present in in the estimates that you get out from a deep learning, and this is of course like a huge field. Uh, like there's a lot of good research going on, um, but then coming from the GP community uh, actually sort of led me to ask that uh, what I actually wanted to do was to tell the model that when you are far away from from data points that were present during training. Just be uncertain. So the problem was that the model was kind of too certain that it, it already knew what it should do. So the question very much boils down to what to do outside the training data. And the motivation for this paper now was basically to get deep learning models to resemble more GPs, which have modern GP priors on them. So basically allow the model to say that outside the training data, I really don't know what I should do. So the motivation was to like make neural networks mimic modern like behavior, uh, which basically means that the models would be like stationary. Uh, they will be locally stationary in this case. Um, and then the possibility to encode sort of uh, certain types of smoothness assumptions in the model. Basically, uh, you know, as in GP models, uh, the modern uh, family of kernels allows you to, to choose various degrees of smoothness, ranging from like very non-smooth non uh, samples to then uh, like basically the RBF, which says that the, the samples are, are like infinitely differentiable. Uh, worth mentioning at this point is that uh, 
in this presentation and in the paper, uh, we're basically concerned with the models, not so much about inference. So uh, much of the Bayesian deep learning uh, research has recently, at least this is sort of my, my interpretation, um, been con concerned with actually how to do uh, good approximative inference in, in sort of these, uh, these uh, neural network models that allow for like probabilistic interpretations. Um, here, we are not that concerned about how to do uh, like efficient or, or principled or, or nice or elegant inference. We just want to make elegant models. Um, so that's why we basically resort to doing MC dropout over the, the um, neural networks. So the, the overall theme is making neural networks slightly more like GPs, but still being neural networks. So basically allowing uh, neural network models to, to get some of that sort of matern look and feel to them, uh, and uh, especially in order to make the models uh, understand that they don't know what happens outside the training data. That that's might be sort of a good, like very short introduction to what, what we, we, we aim for in this project. And all of you are familiar with neural networks. They have their definitive good sides. Uh, they, they work with, with uh, huge data sets, uh, kind of easy to train, um, but then they also have uh, various problems. Uh, the problem I highlight here is, is that uh, it's typically hard to get good uncertainty estimates. And then of course, like uh, I guess most of you are familiar with, with GPs. GPs uh, are of course uh, uh, great in many ways, um, especially they are very convenient to like allow for like this plug and play configuration of, uh, of specifying prior knowledge or functions. And then uh, there's a very principled and nice uh, sort of uh, methodology for training them, uh, and doing predictions and uh, everything's very elegant. But then of course they have their problems, um, like uh, you need to resort to approximate inference when, when you have like uh, non-conjugate likelihood models. And then of course, uh, large data sets uh, cause their own type of problems. Of course, uh, many of you uh, have, have uh, been, been contributing to solving some of these problems. And I think in many applications, uh, these aren't really problems anymore. But then in others, there still are very much problems. So both have their good sides and bad sides. And uh, now I try to take some of the good sides from sides from GPs and plug those into neural networks. Um, yeah. Then uh, going through some of the background, uh, basically that is required for sort of all the downstream stuff uh, in, in the presentation. So um, you know that there are these links between uh, basically uh, like a single layer feed forward neural networks um, with under certain assumptions, uh, taking the, the number of, of hidden nodes to, to infinite, uh, then uh, you, you can like build these links between uh, certain GP priors and, and certain uh, neural networks of this kind with, with specific uh, activation functions. This is like, there is this very, very nice and uh, actually surprisingly simple simple mapping between these things. And there's been nice theory built on top of this more recently, but uh, much of this stuff actually dates back to, to the 90s. Uh, Bradford Neal's, Neal's thesis basically, uh, and then um, some very nice papers by, uh, by Chris Williams. Um, this was basically in like 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998, like around these, these times. So much of the, the sort of underlying theory that uh, uh, I'm also leveraging here is, is basically directly building on top of, of, uh, of Bradford Niels and, and Chris Williams uh, papers in the 90s. And actually, it's kind of funny that when I started looking into this, this, this thing that, that uh, 
what are the the links to to matern uh, like uh, between neural network works and matern covariance functions uh, I kind of assumed that someone had solved this, worked this out in the 90s, uh, or then in the early 2000s, or at least uh, more recently, but I couldn't find anything. And I was at first surprised. Then uh, I started looking into how, the, how, how these things could be derived. And then after that, I, I wasn't that surprised anymore because uh, it turns out that it's not, not trivial. Uh, but at least the first ways I tried to try to use for deriving these things just didn't work out. So then uh, that sort of convinced me that it might actually be that no one has, has actually bothered looking into this, this in more detail. So, okay, setting some of the background here and some of the notation. So let uh, small sigma be some nonlinear activation function. Um, so then the associated kernel for the infinite width network can be written like this. This is basically just, just building on, on the, the uh, nice, nice theory from the 90s. Uh, and of course, like in the absence of a closed form solution to that, that integral, um, you can do like a Monte Carlo approximation. So uh, because in your networks, it's, it's part of the, the, the magic uh, and the, the weirdness of the neural network community that you can basically take any nonlinear function and throw it into a neural network and it probably works somehow okay. So then the, the, the random walk of the neur neural network community has then uh, over the years uh, picked out certain nonlinearities that are clearly working better than others and then those are the, the, the methods to, to go with. Um, like the sigmoid and the the the, the ReLU and, and and all these sort of uh, I'm sure that you you've been using if if you're uh, like employed uh, your networks in in your your research or, or hobbies. Uh, but of course, then like if you take then basically any of these these nonlinearities and then uh, throw them into this this uh, equation, you can sort of numerically approximate what the what the uh, covariance function would look like. And this is actually quite interesting, uh, just coding this up and, and putting different nonlinear functions. Uh, the world is full of nonlinear fun functions and then looking at the kernel. Because if you're familiar with GPs, you're quite used to staring at what, what kernel functions and, uh, and like gram matrices look like. So this is actually quite, quite nice. I recommend this for, for, for all of you. Um, but then of course, then uh, for certain special cases, um, if we, we go back here, um, so basically uh, for certain uh, common choices of, uh, of, uh, of sigmas here, the activation functions, you can actually solve this, uh, this integral, which gives you closed form uh, representations of the associated kernel. And then for some kernels, you can work out what the associated uh, activation is. And this is basically what, what Chris Williams did for, for the RBF. Uh, under certain assumptions. And that's why I sort of thought that someone must have looked at this problem, like what is, what is the sigma if, if you have a matern kernel on this side? But apparently not. Okay, uh, I guess this should be, at least you should be somewhat familiar or, or uh, I guess you have heard of, of these links, links before. So, uh, now let's let's look at the banana classification task. Uh, I'm sure you're most of you are familiar with this uh, rather simple simple uh, like benchmarking data set, which is basically in 2D uh, and it's uh, like a binary classification problem. Uh, and I'm kind of disappointed that it's not a real data set that has something to do with bananas. I actually thought that for for embarrassingly long, <laughs> but it's actually a simulated data set where just the shape shape resembles a banana. So um, if you think of, of uh, uh, like a, a multi-layer perception uh, network, uh, like a basic feed forward network with one hidden layer, uh, here we have uh, 50 hidden units with a step activation. So then uh, others before, before me have actually worked out that uh, what the 
associated kernel is. You can actually solve that in closed form, and it's called the R cosine zero kernel. And uh, for drill U, which is used a lot, uh, is actually the R cosine one kernel. Um, and we can continue uh, for the sigmoidal activation function. Uh, you can also get the closed form kernel. And then uh, on the top row here, I just sort of, uh, actually I use GP flow. Uh, some of these, these covariance functions uh, are present in GP flow already now, and the others I just well, like implemented with a couple of lines of code, and then trained uh, a GP with that, that GP prior, uh, and uh, these are the results then. So you see that, for example, uh, the ReLU is of course like highly non-stationary, but you also see here that um, this basically like depicts the uncertainty. So it's actually extremely certain here outside the data, the uh, uncertainty, like the, the lighter the color, the smaller the, the, the marginal uncertainty. So it's actually like extremely certain about the class when you, you sort of move away from the data. Which then again, if you think of the, the RBF, uh, then of course it's, it gets very uncertain then when, when you go, go outside, outside the data. So in this work now, I'm interested in what is this sort of missing piece here on the bottom right. So given that you have a modern GP prior, so what would the, the, uh, the uh, matching activation function B for the neural network, like the single hidden hidden layer um, in that case. And that's what we now try to work out together here. Is this clear? So the goal is to fill in, fill in this gap here. Good, so what we do. Um, so the link from the activation function to a single infinite uh, um, random neural network uh, to the corresponding uh, GP kernel, this is kind of well understood. But then we actually try to work out the opposite thing, like the, the inverse problem, so to say. So given that you have a GP kernel, what is the activation function? And um, how we do this is by employing some uh, very classical theory from uh, signal processing, uh, like control engineering, uh, which dates back to sort of the, the 50s and 60s uh, or, or even even earlier. So this is the part where sort of the usual signal processing stuff that I, I always tend to find somewhere uh, comes into picture here. I mentioned that I was surprised why this hasn't been like solved before. Like people were looking at, at these things in, in, in the 90s. Um, and for example, if you think of like radial basis functions, uh, radial basis functions are, are used a lot uh, outside the GP community, of course. So like uh, in, in the late 80s, there was sort of this, this surge of interest in, in, in radial basis functions and neural networks. So uh, there are these things like, uh, like radial basis functions, networks, and, and so on, uh, which were like, uh, there are publications from like, uh, I think it's like uh, 1989 and uh, 1990s. Um, like where like Green's functions are used then to, to derive basically the activation functions and showing that you actually, uh, like a RBF basic functions actually result in, in like an RBF shaped activation function that can be used in your networks. Uh, and this is also some of this theory was then uh, uh, also leveraged by Chris Williams in, in his papers in, in, uh, in he had a, like a nearest paper in, in, in 90s uh, about um, like the RBF neural network kernel. And then that part is also nicely written out in the, in the GP book, which I actually have somewhere here, just a minute. So I'm sure like mo most of you have this book. Um, so there's actually a part, part here uh, about kernels, which you know, and then actually uh, like two of these, these kernels uh, are actually like presented also here in this book. Yeah. So then I somehow thought that this would be kind of like uh, old stuff, old school, school, school knowledge. But then uh, the thing is that for the RBF, if you assume like Gaussian input density on, on the inputs, which you 
basically do when, when you, you, you uh, try to match uh, the, the linked neural networks uh, this way. Um, it's actually quite convenient for the RBF, the eigenvalues, eigenfunctions of the associated covariance operator, like corresponding covariance function, they are available in closed form. And this is very handy then for deriving the, the Green's function, which you can use for, for uh, like uh, getting the activations. Um, but then for the matter kernel, those like eigenvalues and eigenfunctions are not available in closed form, which makes it very, very hard to, to derive the Green's function and the rest of the required theory to actually like getting those, those activation functions. So uh, we tried various things with Lassi uh, related to this. Um, Lassi tried approximating them numerically, like the, the Eiger functions, and you kind of could build something that made something sensible, but it was just horribly unpractical to, to like approximate um, eigenfunctions numerically in order to get an activation function that you then plug into a neural network. And this was just crazy. And it, like the theory was not very elegant. It was like, very hacky. Um, so it didn't really work out. So then uh, those of you who know me from before know that I've been working on stochastic differential equations and uh, links between signal processing methods like Gaussian processes in, in signal processing, basic state space models, and then uh, Gaussian processes in, in machine learning, basically uh, like admitting the kernel formalism and links how to go from one of these to, to the other kind of. So then actually sort of through that, uh, I've seen a lot of sort of like these like signal processing tools that you can use for, for analyzing different things in, in, in uh, Gaussian processes in like in different forms. And then that led me to, to sort of uh, propose to Lassi that let's, let's take a totally different angle to these things. And that actually paid off. Um, and what was that angle? Um, consider that uh, we have some stationary covariance function, which is the case for the matter. So, uh, for stationary covariance functions, uh, there is this uh, Fourier duality between covariance function and spectral density function, it's like a one of one mapping, uh, which is linked through the basically Fourier transform. This is, this is known as the, the Wiener Kinchin theorem. Basically, uh, Fourier transform transforming um, like the, the covariance uh, function uh, gives you the spectral density function. And you can go back and forth between these representations and they are basically equivalent. They're just happening in different space. Um, other things also from sort of like the signal processing um, kind of community or signal processing theory uh, is then also like, uh, like the power spectral density of a process. Uh, that's defined in terms of the square of the absolute value of the Fourier transform of the process. So basically Fourier transform of the process is, is not, it's not the Fourier transform of the kernel or the covariance function. It's the actual Fourier transform of the process. So say you have, have, have an F that admits a form of a GP with, with a covariance function. So then it's not, the, like, it's not the Fourier transform of the covariance function, but the Fourier transform of the process itself. Okay. So um, that brings us to transfer functions. So uh, in order to just set some, some notation here, if you think of, of a white noise process, so then, uh, which is just like a white noise realization. So what I just said, that if you, that white noise process is denoted by some small uh, W, then taking the Fourier transform of that, it gives you this, this capital W and then uh, taking the absolute value of that squared is uh, the, the power spectral density in this definition. And this actually also allows us to uh, write a different form of the spectral density function, which basically uh, is the product of the uh, Fourier transform of the, the driving 
uh, Gaussian input, that's basically divide noise, and uh, a transfer function. So then uh, let's think of the transfer function as being some, some magical thing, which we denote by G. So we can then write out that this is equivalent to this guy here. And to take one step further, we write this in this sort of like factorized form where, where we have basically um, a stable part and an unstable part of the transfer function G. The, I will try to give some more intuition into the transfer function later on. So, uh, okay, uh, the typically non-trivial task of finding what this G is, is called spectral factorization in signal processing. Okay, um, so now let's try to do this for the matern. I'm doing time wise, it's pretty okay. Um, so this is just the typical uh, like matern covariance function um, with all the dirty details right, right, written out. Um, that's the gamma function. That's the modified Bessel function. Uh, uh, new here is a smoothness hyperparameter or parameter, uh, and L is a characteristic length scale parameter. And we can do, do the Fourier transform of this guy, and uh, it gives you something like this. Uh, for convenience, I've hidden all the, the constant parameters sort of away, just to make things slightly clearer. And then if we stare enough on, on this uh, spectral density function, we can actually realize that we can write this in this form. Now, like nothing special happened. We just wrote it in a different form. Uh, and this is actually exactly the spectral factorization form. We have, we have two parts which only differ by the sign of the, this part where the imaginary unit, unit appears. So we, we just, what we just did was the spectral factorization for, for the matter, uh, which allows to, to collect the part which is the, the stable part of the, 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 the system, uh, basically stable, stable transfer function, which takes this form. And those constants, which I did hide away on the previous slide, are actually the, the power spectral density of the driving white noise process, uh, which include basically all, all the, the hyperparameters uh, that, that are needed needed for making things exactly match. So note now, I've done no approximations anywhere. Everything is, is totally fixed. I just sort of do the derivation step by step. Now you ask me that, so what? Why would you be interested in, in this signal processing uh, transfer function uh, while we are interested in neural networks in the end? Don't worry, we'll, we'll come there. So now we're actually sort of in, like the, the transfer function is actually sort of working in, in, in the Fourier space. Um, so we, we somehow need to go back to sort of the, the input space. And uh, this is also like uh, required some thinking, but turns out that you can actually do this in closed form uh, using an inverse Laplace transform and then expanding things because you, we want to have things where the, where the uh, basic support is, is the entire real line. So then we, we can uh, use some tricks from, from like Laplace transform theory, um, theory that uh, gives us this. So this is now the inverse Laplace transform of the transfer function. And this actually is directly the transfer or activation function in the input space that we need. I'll, like the source here is trust me, but I'll show you that this actually is the case. Um, and now when I sort of work with Lassie and we, we came this far in, in the derivations, I suddenly realized that, well, in the old neural network 
literature. If you take a book from the 1980s or 1990s about neural networks, activation functions aren't called activation functions. They are called transfer functions. And now like this was sort of like, oh damn, now it all makes sense. Because the transfer function here in the input space is actually the activation function that we want to use. And like, I'm happy if any one of you finds a source on that, why, why they were called transfer functions. Um, I would be very happy, but the only sort of reasoning which I found, I found this far, is that people who started working with neural networks in the very early days actually had typically an electrical engineering background. So they were familiar with transfer functions. But uh, so that's why the terminology sort of came along. I don't right. know. This is, this is just be. Well, guess. so interestingly, the same thing happened in cosmology. So we used the, the term transfer function up until 20 years ago has been used to describe that exact quantity in an astronomical context. But I so don't know it, why. It, it might be the same thing. That pe people have had sort of, they had, in their studies, they probably took courses in electrical engineering. Or, or, I don't know. But I think it's fascinating. Uh, we would need those like older, older generation guys now, uh, like join the discussion and tell tell me that of course it's like this, uh, and trust they watch the video and uh, write uh, tweets where they are very upset. Uh, I don't know. So, one question. Yeah. So, so did you mean, or maybe I misunderstood? Did you mean that this activation function is actually like the impulse response of the of the network thinking like an an invariant system? Yeah, yeah, because sort of like transfer functions are often analyzed in, in, uh, in signal processing, uh, like through the impulse response. And that's actually sort of exactly what this is. And uh, I'm skipping, skipping some part, parts here in this presentation, but if you're interested in more details, read the paper, because I also have a section about sort of the link to Green's functions, which actually is a generalization of the, the, the impulse response as well. So it all comes together in a very nice way. And I had a lot of sort of, uh, oh damn moments when I sort of went through this last spring. And I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about this. I think there's actually some, some of the very old, uh, very established theory that uh, I think people just have forgotten. It's very cool, thanks. Um, so I, I made like this last bullet point, a point here. So all of this, kind of makes sense if you think that what we are actually doing is we are trying to analyze untrained networks where we excite the network with, with Gaussian weights. So we basically what we do, we, we feed in Gaussian noise and then we, we look at the network what it actually does. So this is, this is exactly what we do and this is actually why we want to use the transfer function in the first place. Okay, um, some more details. Um, so what we actually get is, is, the, uh, is like a locally stationary model in the same sense as uh, Chris Williams derived the, the, uh, the expressions for the, for the RBF neural network uh, covariance function, which is here in this book. Um, so basically what the exact covariance function expression looks like is, is basically we have, we have the, the modern here, but when we have these two modulating envelopes, which have, have a link to the, the, uh, the basically the weights in, in that integral, which I showed uh, very early on in the talk. And um, these are basically the, the uh, requirements for, for the values of the, the noise parameters and how they link to the hyperparameters uh, of, of the, that, in that uh, expression. Okay, uh, that was a lot of slides with no figures. I'm very sorry for that. Um, now there will be more figures uh, from this point on. So this was actually the, the activation function that we derived. And what do they look like? Let's plot them. So here you can see, uh, these have been plotted just for, for different, different values of, of the, the smoothness parameter. And what you see here is actually for the exponential covariance function, it looks quite horrible. 
uh, so it's no, not, not differentiable and uh, actually quite hard to train, kind of useless. But then for the rest, if you then like uh, move to smoother priors, then it actually starts uh, looking quite sensible. And uh, there's actually proof in the supplementary of the paper uh, that if you take, take this smoothness parameter to infinity, what you actually recover is just an RBF. That required me uh, some, some thinking in order to, to, to actually like make me believe that that actually is the case. But turns out that you, you can, like if you take the limit, you get an RBF. So that's the dashed line here. It just moves very far, far to the right. And then worth mentioning that in the activation function, the choice of this lambda, which was, let's move a bit back, um, which is basically this quantity here, which takes the length scale in it, is, is arbitrary because that is taken care of, care of by, by uh, scaling the inputs of the network, or actually like previous layers scaling the inputs uh, to this layer. So that's basically, uh, you can fix that to be, say, one. Okay, uh, let's do a sanity check. You remember that I showed uh, very early on this expression, that if you have a activation function, you can just take like Monte Carlo samples and try to work out what the, what the covariance uh, function looks like. And here, the dashed line, which you actually cannot see because it's underneath these lines here, is the exact uh, pattern with those envelopes. And then these lines here, which are slightly noisy, are based on this, this expression, where I just taking take Monte Carlo samples of the weights uh, and then sum those, those up uh, and uh, evaluated the, the covariance. So turns out that things match exactly in the infinite limit of having, having k going to infinity. I think uh, here K might be like a thousand or something like that. So you see it's, it's slightly noisy, but still very well represented. Then the next question is, is this sorry, a good I'm, activation? Oh, sorry, yeah? Can you go back to the previous figure? What's the difference between the, uh, the more jittery lines that are basically not matching your exact uh, maternal integration? Yeah. That, that's basically, there's a discussion in the paper. I just copy pasted this from the paper. Uh, discussion in the paper that uh, depending on what kind of distribution you choose for, uh, let's, let's go back to the very beginning um, here. So this distribution here is a multivariate distribution. It doesn't say that it needs to be Gaussian. So you can take different choices of, of that, uh, what, 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 what inputs you put on, on, on W. And then turns out that uh, this, this is actually something that I realized uh, quite late, that uh, the derivations that uh, Chris Williams did in his, uh, in 19, his 1998 paper, uh, like just bluntly assumed this to be Gaussian. But then if you actually, a better choice would be to consider them being binary white. So you sort of have like, they would be binary value variables, but then uh, basically uh, like with a, with a Gaussian sort of driving, driving that. So then depending on how you choose uh, this, you can actually get different like, like fits to, to different sort of curves. That's like just like how, how you choose that. Like that's, that's, the, more thoroughly discussed in the paper, but then um, the exact match is actually for the binary white ones. And then for the, for the Gaussian weights, this, uh, the tails decay slightly faster. Um, but the practical difference, because uh, in, in kernels, uh, what is important is kind of what happens here, yeah. uh, here. <laughs> so then uh, it's very hard to see any practical difference, but this is just to make the theory very ex explicit. Um, I hope that sort of was clear enough. Um, then some usual sanity checks to, to do. Um, are these good activation functions? 
And then, for example, if you visit Wikipedia and look at the page uh, where they have listed different activation functions, there are many. And then there are like these check marks that do these activation functions fulfill some sort of criterion. Um, and uh, these activation functions do not fulfill all of those criteria, I must say. Uh, they are not monotonic. Uh, and uh, under certain assum assumptions, you can actually show, show that for monotonic activation functions, the error surface is guaranteed to be convex. Uh, this is also under very restrictive assumptions, but still it's kind of preferable for the activation function to be monotonic. These are not. Um, it also saturates to zero for most x, which is kind of also regarded problematic. But this is kind of the same thing for many other, uh, other activation functions. Um, and for, for the exponential, uh, it's not differentiable, which actually is a real problem. This is the actual only real problem that we stumbled upon in the experiments. So it can be really hard to train because sort of, if you think of like you, you try to train uh, uh, like uh, a neural network rate with weights that has uh, uh, an, an activation function of this shape, um, this, this, this shape gets stuck and that's very bad. So yeah, hard to train. But that, that's why the exponential is more of like a uh, interesting peculiar detail here. Can, can I clarify what's the saturation to zero means here? You mean the gradient? Uh, yeah, so the, that means that the gradients become very small. Uh, saturates like this is absolutely zero. And then when you go to infinity here, it also like it, it saturates to zero. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, so that's, that's regarded uh, like problematic. But that's, that's the same for actually quite many wild used activation functions. Um, but worth mentioning still. Okay, um, I'm actually being slower than I thought, which is just good. Um, I have a bunch of exper experiments uh, where we where we then like uh, tried uh, like throwing in the the matern current like uh, activation function and see how that affects the the, the analysis. And sometimes when you write a paper. Uh, the experiments are the tricky part. So you, you, you might have a lot of nice theory and then you try to do some experiments to show that how nice this is um, and then nothing works out. That happens quite often actually. This project was the exact opposite. Whatever we tried worked great. So this, this was like, uh, like skiing downhill. Uh, so I was like, that's why we had quite many experiments in the paper. We had, everything worked. Um, so, Let's first look at a very, very simple simulated uh, case, which is often seen in these sort of like Bayesian deep learning papers, uh, which is a very simple setup, which is actually quite tricky. You might have seen some papers from like Rich Turner's group where they often have this, this example. So you have two clusters of data and you would like the model to be uncertain about what happens in between. And if you have a real view, it's very hard to be uncertain what happens in between. Because your model says, your prior says that you shouldn't be uncertain. And that's what, what you can see here. Then for the, for the RBF uh, neural network uh, covariance function, the uh, things look, look quite good in the GP, GP space and somewhat sensible uh, in, in, in the, you may use in the RBF activation. And these of course do not exactly match because uh, for the GP, the hyper parameters have been trained separately. And here, uh, there's only 50 hidden units. And uh, so we haven't even tried getting these things to match exactly. But it, they have the same prior. Um, then using our like Matern 5.2 kernel, uh, here the hyperparameters are actually like, uh, they become uh, quite different from, from what, what uh, the kind of equivalent type of parameter uh, in this model are, but still we see that uh, the model is actually quite uncertain about what happens here outside the data. And then with the modern tree two, uh, it gets even more wiggly as you would expect. And then for uh, exponential, like modern one two, uh, 
Do you actually like see this familiar behavior, what you would expect for, for a method? And now with 50 hidden units, this actually sort of is, is a bit stochastic. So th these are actually like what you would expect, like reducing the, the, the smoothness parameter actually reduces the smoothness here as well. Okay, uh, then the 2D like case. Uh, Arno, yeah. uh, question. you say we not, not bother too much with, uh, with inference, but how do you set the kernel hyperparameters in these examples? Uh, the kernel hyperparameters uh, here, uh, for, the, for the GP, the top row, the green ones, those are trained with respect to marginal likelihood. Uh, and basically here, for the matter activation, uh, they, are, the, they are implicitly trained because the characteristic magnitude and length scale are dependent on, on uh, the previous layer, the, sort of the, the, uh, the weights scale the inputs. So basically you implicitly train the hyperparameters when training the neural network. So there actually aren't any hyperparameters left anymore. Okay, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. This is actually something that uh, the reviewers of the papers, uh, paper also asked about. So uh, we tried to make it somewhat more clear in the, in the, in the camera ready version. Um, so I showed this already earlier. And now uh, for the modern 5.2 kernel, uh, with 50 hidden units, which is not quite enough, probably. Uh, it looks a bit messy, but it has sort of the same kind of behavior in the, in the decision boundaries and uh, the same sort of decay uh, of the uncertainty outside. It looks a bit ugly. So if you would uh, put more hidden units or then do ensembling, then you would get it to match more the top row, but then uh, this is maybe more truthful because uh, you have typically quite a small number of hidden units uh, compared to what you actually might might need. Um, then some of the more like real empirical benchmarks. So um, there are these previous models uh, that have been published before. Um, like which are sort of like hybrid models where there's like a neural network and then at the end the outputs from the, the neural networks are then put into a GP where the GP is kind of the last layer of, of the model. Um, models like this are like the GP DNN and SVDKL uh, methods. Uh, one is from, from Andrew uh, Gordon Wilson's group and the other one from, from the, the machine learning group in, in Cambridge. Um, so they actually like these models kind of try to do exactly the same as we. So what we did was that we just replaced the, the GP part at the end of these hybrid models with just, just a normal neural network layer with the matern, matern uh, um, like activation functions and then uh, tried uh, these models with different uh, matern priors um, for the GPs and then also for the for the for the matter activations, um, some details. Uh, yeah, so we actually like the model is kind of the same. The model and these assumptions that are done are the same, but then uh, ours is just just a neural network, while these hybrid models have both a neural network and a GP. And the thing here is that of course, like the ideal GP model would probably be better, but then in practice, in both of these methods here, like the hybrid methods. Uh, you need to do some approximations. You need to do approximate inference uh, for the classification, and you need to do some sparse things for, for the, or like frank reduced things for dealing with the huge number of, of, of data points. So then it's kind of like, the model, model is nice, but then you end up sort of approximating maybe too much. And then actually research in, in terms of uh, like predictive, uh, uh, like, like uh, likelihood or uh, negative log predictive density, uh, we do very well. The baseline here is just like a single, like a shallow GP, which is not, it, it does, that's okay, but not as good as this hybrid. So th these kind of are all this, like the same model assumptions are in these, or this is just like a, like a vanilla GP. Um, also in terms of accuracy, we do well. Uh, and in terms of area under the curve, 
we do well. But most importantly, I think uh, in terms of like uh, NLPD, where also the uncertainty counts, this works great. Okay, then in the paper title, we had uh, had uh, like out of distribution uh, characterization. So actually like making the model aware of uh, that test data points can be outside the training data set. And this is often what you probably would like to do when you characterize uncertainties in deep learning. Um, so what we do here is that we, we have Cypher 10. We train a classifier with only five classes, with plane, car, bird, cat, deer, and then test with all 10 classes where also ship, truck, frog, dog, and horse are present. And if we compare to a ReLU, which actually cannot tell apart uh, like the, the, the test points in the known classes and unknown classes, the uncertainties are kind of the same. So it, it actually, like the model doesn't learn that, that, uh, that these po training points are, are here and the test points might be somewhere else. It just mixes up everything. Well then with an RBF activation or maternal activations, you actually get benefits. The model sort of learns to keep, keep sort of the unknown classes uh, like separate and it, even though it tries to classify those and gives a predicted label, it also knows that it's more uncertain about these labels because it hasn't seen training data of that kind. And then uh, this can also be like seen empirically. If you can look at samples in these tails, like uh, highest uh, uncertainty um, of like known, known classes, uh, basically this part of the tail, and lowest uncertainty of the unknown classes, basically this part of the tail. So then actually uh, the ReLU activation function uh, gives out quite a lot of nonsense, while then using a maternal activation actually uh, Couples like cat and dog are given like, because one of them was not in the training that set, so it doesn't know about dogs, but then it, it gives him a cat label with high uncertainty and sort of like th this analyzing, like looking at the, 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 the images that are sort of misclassified, uh, make a lot of sense. So the uncertainties are actually like descriptive. And this is very cool. I would like to talk about this more, but let's forward. And then as a final experiment, we actually looked into radar emitter classification, which is basically used in, uh, in recognizing aircrafts uh, in aviation. And classical methods lose like use table lookup, but then uh, of course, uh, for making things more scalable, you would like to, to just train these so learning based approaches. But here actually like uncertainty quantification is extremely important. You shouldn't sort of mistake uh, one plane for another plane type and so on. So this is kind of very important in these kind of applications. Uh, a short recap. Uh, we introduced a new family of nonlinear neural network activation functions that try to mimic the properties of the matter family of kernels in GPU models. Uh, and this, these new activation functions, they result both in good performance and uncertain uh, calibration in Bayesian and deep learning tasks as was shown in the experiments. Uh, and especially good results we got in this like out of distribution uh, estimation tasks. The code is available, uh, have a look at that. Um, and I'm including references to uh, relevant papers that I mentioned, uh, like uh, when going through these things. Uh, most of them are here. Uh, there are a lot of other relevant papers as well, but those are cited then in the, in the main paper. Please have a look at those. And then the, the motivating example that shown was uh, showed was from, from this future paper, which is kind of unrelated to the theory here, but I included that nevertheless. Thank you. That was the presentation. Uh, that was exactly 60 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Any much. Any questions? Thank you very much, Arno. Uh, so you do have a bit of time, right? If some people want to stay on the call for some questions, they, they can do so. Brilliant. Yeah, indeed. I'm, I'm happy to stay. Uh, I, I have plenty of time. Yeah. So, um. Okay, maybe I'll start while uh, people are looking for the raise hand uh, button. Um, can you talk a bit more about the effect of the input distribution on the eigenfunctions? 
So you, it, someone asked me the question not long ago and I was not sure uh, what to answer. Because of course, if you change the distribution over the input, you change the, what would be the eigenfunctions and eigenvalue and for the RBF, like it's kind of convenient. There's one configuration where we can compute them. But then later on in the, in the talk, you were making the link with the local stationarity and these kind of things. Could you say a bit more? That actually, like, that's a very good question. And like, it's somehow like a recurring t thing uh, to end up staring at the, the, the RBF uh, with, with like a Gaussian input density. Uh, actually, this is something that we also had discussed before, I think. Um, so I'm not aware of, of like any good theory uh, regarding any other like closed form, form solutions. So then, of course, like if you then use any any other uh, input densities, uh, then typically um, you need to resort to some sort of approximations when when then solving them. And of course, that that you can do. Uh, it's fairly easy to numerically solve the the uh, eigen eigen functions or eigen values. Uh, but then uh, you you typically need to resort to some approximations or numerical methods for doing that. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, I probably cannot give you that, that much new things that you, you wouldn't know about here, but I, I think there's typically, uh, this, this is sort of a hard thing. And if there would be good solutions to this, also not novel theory developed uh, in like elsewhere, I think that would directly contribute to uh, nice new methods in, in, in GP, GP related things. Thanks. And from a practitioner point of view, would you relate this density to the distribution of the data sets you have at hand or not really? It's, uh, it's, it's more of like just, just a computational tool. Um, so typically um, the, the, the Gaussian input density assumption is kind of restrictive, but then uh, in practice, it's, it's only used like for derivations um, so then uh, I don't see that as actually sort of a, a problem then in, in like downstream application of methods. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Vincent has his uh, hands up. Yes, hi. Thank you, Arno, for the great presentation. Uh, if I understood everything correctly, you were anal analyzing these um, neural networks in a single layer case, but I guess your analysis would also work in the in the in a deeper case with L layers, especially like the transfer function would probably become a, the power of the same transfer function. Have you have you thought about that? Yeah. So so basically, like the, all the analysis is built on like a single uh, single layer layer case as as usual. But then uh, Alexander Matthews uh, has a paper which was published not very long ago. Uh, might have been last year or the year before, or but quite recently still. Um, where he actually has uh, derived some very nice theory for for actual like deeper deeper models, uh, and like I guess that's the first time anyone has shown that that uh, this this analysis also works for deeper models. So there's there's also the neural tangent kernel, uh, which got quite popular. But my my I have I guess a follow up question is, so we know for infinite with single layer neural network it tends to a Gaussian process, and we can also with the neural tangent kernel we have these. Uh, these deep neural networks, which we can approximate with a single layer Gaussian process. But then in practice, we actually, we actually see that deep neural networks work, work well because the first layers are just feature extractors and they just extract features. And then we have a very simple classifier at the end. I'm wondering like what, from a practical point of view, what is the best thing to do here? Do you actually still want depth and, and just think of it as feature extractors? Or do you want a single layer GP with a kernel and do everything at once? What, what do you think is best to do and, and uh, like for future research as well? Yeah, so basically I think that depends on the application. So uh, for like uh, single layer layer uh, neural networks, basically uh, with infinite wide width, which basically is just a, just a vanilla GP, uh, that is very interpretable and uh, very, very sort of nice in many ways. But then for example, here in, in this, this task, this is actually like a, does exactly what you said. So there is there is sort of like this this deep model which which basically extracts features and then you do the, the, the classification at the end. And just from these results, it's quite clear that uh, 
actions or the feature extractor is very useful there. Uh, probably par partially because uh, it's hard to design uh, a good prior that would sort of actually encapsulate uh, suitable suitable sort of knowledge for the for like the single layer layer case. So like extracting features uh, help a lot here, um, and then also like the the feature extraction part probably gets to to uh, deform the data in a suitable way so that the inputs to the last layer are better uh, in, in, in some sense. Thank you. I think uh, I can hand over the mic to Stephanus, who has raised his hand. It's, you almost asked my question, so I'll just uh, restate what I have in mind and probably some of it has been already answered, maybe some of it hasn't. Uh, so yeah, my first concern was like from a practitioner's uh, kind of uh, side, what, what, when would you suggest to switch from, uh, uh, let's say a GP with a matern activation, uh, with a matern kernel, or to go to a deep, to, to a neural network with matern activation function. So when is this boundary of uh, gaining or losing by switching from one to the other? Uh, and the other question is like, in a deep network uh, scenario, would you, would you choose a matern activation for all the layers or for the last layer where you expect it to be closer to the data? And as Vincent said, that in the previous layer with some more fancy activations, you extract some better features. Good questions. For the first question, uh, I think this is not anything that would repl replace like the, the usual applications of, of GPs, um, GP models. This is more of, of like a tool tool to bring over some of the, the uh, model design, uh, way, ways of designing good models that we used to, to uh, in, in the GP community, uh, bring some of that over to the neural network community. That, that, that may be a sort of uh, what this tries to be. Um, and exactly an application like that is, is for like this, this Cypher 10, 10 experiment where uh, where there is like, well, well like computer vision task uh, overall, you typically want to have that. So if you just use the, the image itself as the input to GP, for example, um, you're typically not doing very well. Or then you would need to design a very specific kind of uh, covariance function to, to deal with that. So it's a lot easier from a practitioner point of view to, to have that uh, deep, uh, feature extractor kind of thing in front, and then kind of uh, try to try to apply the the, the kind of GP like behavior at the end, and that's basically the the motivation between this uh, behind this uh, GN, like neural network plus GP hybrid models uh, that have been proposed before, um, and I think those are not widely used, uh, or uh, I'm not aware of them being widely used, but I think the same logic there uh, sort of carries over to this work. Um, Lassie also tried, uh, like, like more recently, um, like using, using like, uh, uh, only the, the, uh, or the matern activation functions on, on all, all layers. And that also works. Um, that's, that's not a problem. Um, but then basically in, in these experiments, we want to have like fix some parts of the model and then just tune, tune one part. So that's why here, for example, it's only on the last layer. But then, yeah, in computer vision tasks, I think uh, to get like good uncertain calibration and like out of distribution, uh, like characterization, uh, this actually seems to be a very good tool for that. I have another question if no one else, I haven't checked. Uh, okay. Uh, since no one else has it in their hand app, I'll jump on and ask, uh, given your, signal processing background and all the SDE work that you've done in the past, have you, I mean, first of all, does it make sense to apply something like that on a deep uh, GP in a time, in a deep neural network that operates on a timeline, like uh, warping the time? And what sort of uh, behavior would you 
what sort of samples we'll get out of that uh, uh, neural net. Do you have an intuition? And actually, does it make any sense uh, in your mind at all? Uh, I didn't quite understand the question. So, so do you mean you, like you, you can still have that uh, deep uh, deep neural network with uh, 1D inputs, right? So where the input in the beginning is the time itself. And uh, what sort of behavior would you expect to get out of it? Have you studied it at all? Do you think it's completely useless as a model? Or... <laughs> I, no, I mean, the short question is that I haven't looked at it. Uh, so like it's, it's a bit hard to say sort of, well, like uh, probably would need to, to look at it in a bit more detail. But then like maybe a related thing is then like, uh, like recurrent neural networks and like LSTM kind of things that how, how do they link to all this? And, and is there some sort of interesting stuff that uh, could sort of like uh, be leveraged and like uh, to deep, deepen sort of the understanding of like uh, RNAs? Yeah, it's definitely worth, yeah. worth considering. Yeah. yeah. So th th this is actually something uh, like I've talk talked about with, with, with Lassi. Um, and uh, yeah. But that's that's maybe on on the level where where we are at the moment. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I have an, a question regarding uh, comparisons uh, of uncertainty representation between, for example, GPs. You have shown a couple of uh, figures comparing GPs and uh, neural networks with these uh, major activations. Um, do, do you have some kind of quantitative measure, or because it, it seems like I see it. There are quite a few papers now where they kind of try to compare GP on one side and then uh, neural network on the, the other, uh, uh, but it's like based on eyeballing. So do you have any kind of good quantitative measure for uh, uncertainty representation? How well it's, uh, they match? I think like just comparing neural networks and GPs is, is, is like comparing uh, cats and dogs. Uh, like you, you, you only end up in a fight if you discuss with someone uh, about that. Um, I know that there are, these are cat, cat persons present here, uh, probably some dog persons as well. Um, but then basically, I, I, like my personal opinion is that uh, neural networks and GPs are, are both tools. And uh, it's like comparing a hammer and a saw. So like, uh, like a hammer is good for, for hammering and a saw is good for, for sawing, but uh, then, uh, yeah, which one is better? Uh, so they they have their like different different uses. So if you think of like a single layer case with where you don't have uh, extremely much data, say you have less than two thousand data points, uh, and you have a single layer neural network, then why not use GP? Like then, then I think there's no reason to use neural network. That's my personal opinion. But then if you have uh, a computer vision task, for example, where you need a, a deep neural network to, for, for, uh, for good performance, uh, and you have millions of data points, then the question is that why use a GP? Um, so then, uh, of course, like uh, there are good models for certain applications, um, but then I think the, the uses are different, and rather than just trying to to have the uh, saw and the hammer compete to it, with each other, we should maybe think that how can one help the other and what are the links between these models? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Did that answer your question at all? <laughs> well, I was wondering more about the uh, quality of the uncertainty representation in the neural networks. Um, how yeah, can so we, sure, think, we sure yeah, that for, it's really doing a good job? Uh, uh, do we have any kind of quantitative measure how well it compares to a golden standard like GP? Yeah, so for, for example, I guess in all these cases, these, these uh, toy cases here, all, all these and all these, the, the GP, of course, gives you a better, uh, like, better calibrated uncertainties. It, it, it's, it's more principled, it's, it's less stochastic, it's less prone to 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 uh, to overfitting to something or getting stuck somewhere or or, or or something like that. So of course, like in these cases, 
uh, the GP is the clear winner uh, if, if you want to have them compete. But it's a, maybe a bit unfair fair task to compare, compare them. So, uh, so that's why then, um, then um, basically in, in these, these cases, the, the, uh, the hybrid models or, the, or basically the neural network uh, wins here, not by a large margin. They are like the GP is still, still a good model here and probably with a more suitable uh, prior, uh, uh, it, it would work good as well. Um, but then in these computer vision tasks uh, here, uh, it's very hard to quantify the uncertainty and uh, you're kind of working blind here as well. So uh, even though uh, the, uh, the modern activations clearly work a lot better than the real you here, but uh, there is kind of no theoretical guarantee that these are, are always good. So the, it's, it's because you, you have only like a small number of, of hidden units uh, compared to the complexity uh, of, the, of the data. So then uh, this kind of a leap of faith to trust in these uncertainty estimates. Okay. But it's better than no, uners, no, no uncertainty estimate at all. So maybe that's that's sort of what I'm trying to say. Okay, thank you very much. It's been uh, twenty minutes past the past the hour, so I would suggest we uh, we stop here. But uh, thank you, thank you very much, Arno, for for the talk. It was a it was a very very good one, and uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for presenting the this work, and thanks everybody for for attending. Thank you very much. Uh, and I just want to add that uh, if I would be there at your office presenting, we would probably go out for, for beers now. But now we need to, to go out for the beers uh, at some later point. And I expect you all to, all to join me uh, when I come there to visit you next time. Yeah. We're very, looking, very much looking forward to, to have you around, Anna. <laughs>